Hello. Hi. 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 Hello. I'm curious about. I'm curious about. I'm curious I'm about. Curious about. I'm curious about building open, authentic, loving relationship. I'm curious about jealousy. I'm curious about polyamory. Does it just mean that you're fucking all the time? How can I tell my parents that my partner is already married? I'm curious about... How do you know when you're too busy to have another relationship? I'm curious about dominant and subordinate relationships. I'm curious about sexual health. How can relationships can evolve with people evolve as they grow, they grow and change? change. In that fictional fantasy self that, like, who you're supposed to be, there are some pretty straightforward rules about who you're supposed to be. I say straightforward, but actually they're a bunch of bullshit. Welcome to the Curious Fox podcast for those challenging the status quo in love, sex, and relationships. My name is Effie Blue. And I'm Jacqueline Misla. And today we're talking about how to have great sex with a person who we've been looking forward to talking with for a while. I'm Emily Nagoski, and I'm a sex educator. I teach people to live with confidence and joy in their bodies. Dr. Emily Nagowski is the author of several books, including Burnout, The Secret to Unlocking the Stress Cycle, and the wildly popular Come As You Are, the surprising new science that will transform your sex life. The research insights and takeaways from Come As You Are helped me look at my own sexuality and intimacy with new eyes. As someone who believed that I was destined to be in partnerships with mismatched libidos, the ideas in this book offered a new perspective on how to view desire and the environments that excite or inhibit that desire. Emily threads together sexual scripts, dual control model of sexual response, social influence, and other various important studies on gender and sexuality to help us understand how to connect with our bodies, our partners, and our pleasure, and what disconnects us from all of this in a super accessible way. We started off our conversation by talking about a reoccurring theme in the book. So... Emily, when I think about you, I think of you like an anthropologist. I think that you have looked at different factors within one's body and one's environment to better understand why sex may or may not be enjoyable. And in a world where we hold ourselves to one set of standards, and that's what we should look like, and that's what sex should be like, can you talk a little bit about the need to understand our uniqueness to help us better understand our sex lives? Boy, can I. I could spend an hour just on that question. On the day you're born, you get handed a script that's very much shaped by the shape of your genitals. Somebody looks at your body and goes, it's a boy or it's a girl. And that determines the instruction manual that you're supposed to follow for the rest of your life. And in the it's a girl script, the ideal for you is to be pretty happy, calm, generous, and unfailingly attentive to the needs of others. And because you have a moral obligation to be this way, if you fall short in any way, in any moment, you deserve to be punished. And if there's no one around to punish you, you just go ahead and beat the crap out of yourself, right? And on the other side, if you get the It's a Boy script, it says you have to be confident, strong, invulnerable, infallible, and independent. Have no needs. Nobody's allowed to have any needs of their own in this system. So there is this model of the ideal sexual self that is out there. I think of it as a cross, like an enormous canyon. And then there's where you are, and there's where this ideal is, this fictional fantasy, ultimately like a tool of the oppressor ideal that you're supposed to be. And the more you are not that thing, the more there's something wrong with you and you need to keep working on yourself. And how dare you sit still and like yourself exactly as you are because you're failing to be that thing. Right now is blanket permission to stop trying to be that thing because you never will be. Amelia and I have a... Amelia actually wrote a song about it called The Abyss, which is about the unbridgeable chasm between who you truly are and who the world expects you to be, because no one is that ideal right. thing. Everyone is who they actually are, does not exist even a little bit. And I think that the real having it all is being able both to be fully who you are and being accepted and welcomed in your community, in your family. 
being safe to walk around on the street, being exactly who you are. That's having it all. It's not about what you own or how many family members you have or how often you have sex or anything like that. It's just, can you be fully yourself and also simultaneously have permission to participate fully in your community? Because the reason we're working so hard to be that ideal is because if we fall short, we get punished and ostracized and left out. And we desperately long to be included and feel welcome and able to participate. And we ruin our opportunity to have any level of friendship, connection, or intimacy when we believe in the fictional self because we walk around wearing masks pretending like we are the thing. And so the people we meet get to know the mask and they like it. And you want to become more intimate with them. And you start to maybe like show them some stuff behind the mask. And maybe they love that. Or maybe they can't cope. I thought I knew who you were and now you're doing all these things. So that's why. That's why uniqueness. Sure. Sure. I think also with the mask... I can completely understand why the other person would be like, well, that's not that's not who I signed up to. So I think even though those masks might get us to connect with people and, and be intimate, ultimately when you do take the mask off, it is a bit of a bait and switch, right? And I think I see that across relationships all the time. I don't know if I'd call it a bait and switch because that implies like a deliberate manipulation. And it's not at all that. All of us are doing this mm-hmm. all the time. I mean, just to like get through the day, Mm -hmm. to have a perfectly reasonable interaction with the checkout lady at the grocery store. Mm -hmm. We all like put on our social masks, we smile and are polite, and that's good. We go on a first date with somebody and we're on our best behavior, Mm -hmm. we say. And that's not a bad thing to do. Mm -hmm. If you're too full on, like if you're like, date one, let me explain my trauma story to you. (laughs) Right. Yeah. (laughs) Because of the nature of the way social interactions are formed, it builds gradually, necessarily, when you're first getting to know someone. Mm -hmm. It is normal to have like little starting bids of trust and intimacy uh, to see how the person reciprocates, to Mm. find out if they're trustworthy. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because trust takes a leap of faith Mm -hmm. and. I think what you're saying too is the irony is that we we are in relationship because we want to have connection and we want to feel belonging, but our strategy for that involves hiding or masking ourselves, which then gets in the way of the connection and the belonging and impacts in the trust because we don't trust and they don't trust. And there's like this game of who's going to trust first that I can see we've, we've just put ourselves in this cycle of being so in our heads, which again, I imagine then takes us out of our bodies when yeah. it's time to be sexually intimate. We're just in this like game of chess in our minds. I want to make sure we're not villainizing the mask because we wear it for a reason. Oh, absolutely. It's because in our childhood, yeah. we were punished for being yes. who we truly are. Um, mm. I was raised yes. as a girl and I was literally told that I look ugly when I'm angry. Yes. Mm-hmm. Punished and then highly rewarded when we do the mask well. Yes, exactly. A hundred percent. We get rewarded when we do the mask well. So it, and so in order to avoid outright rejection because we have been taught to be ashamed of the person we truly are. We're not just going to like put that out there. That doesn't make because just like rejection after rejection after rejection. Plus people have expectations of people behaving themselves. One of the things that you look for in a good person potentially is that there's someone who knows how to navigate the world and be a person just out among other people. It's not an evil, bad thing. It's really important. I get feelings about it because I'm autistic and Mm -hmm. I didn't get diagnosed until I was in my 40s. And it took that long because I am so fucking good at masking. Mm -hmm. And when people are like, you've been faking it all along, you've been pretending like, no, man, I built that out of me. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay, let me bring this bring this back though. It totally makes sense, and we all experience it, especially as women, especially as people who don't conform and who women mask as much as autistic men. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Neurotypical women mask sure. as much as autistic. Yeah, men. that makes sense. Just all the time. Yes. No, I I, I totally get that, and and it's associated is- with negative health outcomes. Just. I'm sure. I'm of sure. Of course. Um, negative physical health, mental health, yep. spiritual health. I mean, I, I, it's clear that that is not good for us in any way. 
Um, I want to bring the, this conversation back to our sexual expression, though. How does that then affect our sexual expression and how we show up in our sexuality? Yeah. How does the mask then affect that that sexual connection or our sexual expression? Right. So in that fictional fantasy self that like who you're supposed to be, there are some pretty straightforward rules about who you're supposed to be. I say straightforward, but actually they're a bunch of bullshit. So I have an identical twin sister. We were raised in the same household. And by the time I got to high school age, I had a clear sense of who I was supposed to be as a sexual person, gleaned primarily from romance novels and Glamour magazine. Mm -hmm. Like I remember reading an article that said, men really like it when you make noise and touch your breasts. They like to see that you're enjoying yourself is what it said. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't having any sex at that time. But when I started having sex, I made sure that I acted like I was having a good time without any reference to whether or not I actually was having a good time. But I wanted to, you know, I wanted to please my partner, pretty happy, calm, generous and attentive to the needs of others. It will make him feel good if I show him pleasure without any reference to whether or not I actually feel pleasure which is not great. And I had to spend a bunch of time disentangling myself and becoming aware of my own pleasure. But my identical twin sister, by the time she got to high school, had the opposite message absorbed in her body that good girls don't. They don't have any sexual desire. They can keep their base animal instincts under control. They only have sex in order to please the men in their lives. Mm -hmm. We absorbed the extreme opposites of who people are supposed to be when they get the It's a Girl script because of small differences in our basic temperament. Mm -hmm. And Amelia had to do the same thing of disentangling herself from all the lies that she had been told. And she also had to access her own pleasure. For both of us, the solution of finding out who we truly are was connecting with what brings us genuine pleasure. And with the, oh man, let's talk about masculinity and the ways that that's toxic and dangerous to men and also to everyone. When you get the It's a Boy script, that comes with a bunch of very screwed up rules about sex, which is that you can measure your worth as a human by the number of people you can convince to let you put your penis inside them, that you have a right to sex. That sex is the one and only appropriate way to access connection mm -hmm. and a feeling of intimacy and being held. And that if someone turns down sex, they're not just turning down sex. They're turning down any, any degree of intimacy and connection with them because that's the only one that the it's a boy people are allowed to have. And the it's a boy folks have access to three emotions. They're granted permission to have three emotions, anger, we all know is like sort of like the hyper masculine toxic thing. Second one is winning. Mm -hmm. You're allowed to feel winning. Like I can't, there's not like an emotion name for it. It's just, yeah. <laughs> and then the third emotion is horny. Mm -hmm. So given a longing for connection and intimacy, you look at the th three, I mean, you're not doing this as a conscious process, but you look at the three options you have available and you're like, which one is closest? And often it's sex. And so you ask for sex and what you're actually asking for is any kind of intimacy and connection with another human being. And when they say no, they're turning down intimacy and connection with you. And remember, because your identity, your validity as a human on earth can be measured by your ability to convince people to let you put your, their, your penis inside them, they're also invalidating your existence. Mm. It's super screwed up. Yeah, you write about, as you're saying now, the role that media plays in all of this and, and, and creating the scripts for ourselves. And that's something that we talk a lot about in terms of changing the noise. Can you talk a little bit more about that? How does being mindful of what you are intaking and changing the noise then impact and improve your sex life? Oh, yeah. Uh, so it's a sort of like media nutrition. Only let stuff into your brain that makes you feel better and good about who you are filter out the stuff that makes you feel bad. Mm -hmm. It's a really simple strategy with a very simple like, after I watch that, do I feel better about my life or worse about my life? And only include the stuff that makes you feel better about your life. Because 
the media messages we consume. I mean, I just told you the romance novels and mm-hmm. Glamour magazine were mm-hmm. basically my sex education. Mm-hmm. Amelia had different inputs, and so she had a different outcome, and both of them were lies. Mm-hmm. When we got to adulthood, we could make choices about what we accepted and what we weren't going to accept. So I stopped reading women's magazines. Mm-hmm. That's for skips. They have changed a lot, though, to give them their props. Like sure. They have come a very long way. And actually, I don't think they do very much of the 50 ways to rock his cock. I think the last 10 years <laughs> have shown yeah. a giant improvement in the quality of mm-hmm. the stories. So one time I was talking with students about this and I said, if it doesn't make you feel good, if it makes you feel bad, consider uh, dropping it from your inputs in your life. Mm. And the student said, but what if I like that it makes me feel bad? And I, Mm -hmm. yeah. Like motivation? It's the way you can't stop tonguing a cold sore mm-hmm. or like picking mm-hmm. at a scab sure. like mm-hmm. the pain feels like something important mm. you like you're just like fascinated sure. by the pain yeah i get that so if people are feeling resistant to the idea of only integrate the media that feels good in your life mm-hmm. like i get that there can be something appealing about the suffering you inflict on yourself mm. and Let's just be aware that that's what you're doing Mm. and ask what function the pain serves in your life. Mm -hmm. In what way is it making it easier for you to be who you truly are, which ultimately is the goal? Mm -hmm. Because sometimes it's about motivation. Like if I whip myself harder, yeah, I'll totally be able to. (laughs) My dog, my dog barks at the mail truck every day and every day the mail truck leaves. And my dog is totally sure that her barking makes the mail truck go away. Mm. So a lot of us have been beating the shit out of ourselves for a long time, punishing ourselves, exposing ourselves to media, like Instagram accounts that make us feel so bad about ourselves. Mm. And we are as successful as we are. Like we got to where we are at Mm. the same time as we were beating the shit out of ourselves. And so there's a part of us that is like, well, the reason I have gotten this far, the reason I do make any change is because. I was beating the shit out of myself. Mm. But the mail truck was going to leave anyway, is my point. Mm -hmm. You were going to get as far as you... You didn't get this far. You didn't accomplish all the things that you have accomplished. You didn't get to be this person because you beat yourself up. Mm. You got here in spite of the fact Mm. that you were injuring yourself every day with the negative messages. Mm. I, I think of critical internal self-critical thought as a whip. Like I grew up with a Irish Catholic father who talked about hair shirts. Mm. So I think about it as like cat of nine tails whipping myself. Mm. And like, I got to where I am despite the fact that like every day I was whipping my back with a cat of nine tails and requiring energy to heal from the wounds that I was inflicting on myself mm. and then reopening those wounds the next time I did it. Mm-hmm. And here's my question. What happens when you put down the whip? Mm -hmm. What happens when you put down the social media accounts or the other media that you take in that makes you feel bad about yourself? What happens when you drop it? You don't get worse. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You start to heal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then you get even stronger than you have ever been before in your entire life. And it's not easy. Healing hurts. Mm -hmm. And you've already been in pain for, you know, Mm -hmm. every day that you've had the whip in your hand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But you had strategies for numbing that pain. And the strategies for numbing this self-inflicted pain are not the same as the strategies for managing the pain of healing. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, where people fall down. They want to, they're like, I stopped beating myself up and now I hurt more. What do I do? And the answer, I mean, is self-compassion. I mean, we even say better the devil we know, right? So it's like, I know that pain. I have, like you said, I have strategies for that pain. And mm-hmm. then this this new pain is unknown and it's scary, even though at the, the other end of that pain is is relief. It's yeah. scary because I don't understand that process. And I, I know how to manage this pain and I've been inflicting my, on myself for, for years, right? So I think there's familiarity of that pain is probably what mm-hmm. keeps us picking up that scab, right? 
Right. We um, think that we think that level of pain is the normal way that being alive feels. Right. 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 Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of this in the root of it has trauma. Right. We know this sort of negative self-talk, this self isolation all this stuff has in the root of it. There is trauma. Right. Yeah. So I, I'm curious. This is some of the work that that you're doing as well, that what steps can folks take to develop a healthy relationship with sex and sexuality after experiencing trauma? It's such an important question because so many people are survivors of intimate partner violence, sexual violence, relationship violence, childhood trauma, neglect and abuse. All So many of us are walking around with scars, at least two thirds of us. One in three of the cisgender women listening to this have experienced intimate partner violence or sexual violence. One in six of the cisgender men and over half of the trans non-binary agender folks. It's a lot of people, Mm -hmm. which is why it's such good news that people do heal. I hear from people literally every day talking about their story of healing from trauma. It's going to sound flippant and I don't mean it that way, but like therapy is a really good place to start. (laughs) Yeah, we are very pro therapy here. Yeah. And there are lots of different kinds of therapy. It doesn't have to be like, don't think that therapy has to be going and talking about the terrible thing that happened to you, which obviously you might not want to do. There are body-based psychosomatic interventions like somatic experiencing. EMDR. Excellent example, highly evidence-based, especially for recent traumas, but Mm. also for distant past traumas. Mm. You don't have to talk about anything. Mm -hmm. You just notice what's happening in your body and recalibrate your body's responses because trauma happens when you get trapped inside your own stress response cycle. When your fear gets activated and you lock into that fear, though you can also do talk therapy. There's also CBT and DBT, dialectical behavioral therapy. There are so many evidence-based approaches to healing from trauma. There are books specifically about healing from trauma in general and healing from sexual trauma. If you are into the science of these things, highly recommend The Body Keeps the Score. Mm. Mm-hmm. That book will change your life. Totally. Yes. Yeah. We, we've mentioned that book before and it's in our re- reading list. It's definitely a book that I recommend to people as well. It's heavy. I say this to people all yeah. the time. Yeah, it's like, big. Be prepared to put it down, walk away it's and come back yeah. to it whenever you're ready. Because I think it speaks about trauma in such a way that it, it just sees you. It's one of those very few That's... times that I felt the book was seen. Like I was seen by a book and it, it yeah. made me kind of nervous. So I'd like put it down, walk away and then come back to it and, and read a bit more, or read a bit more. So I, I always tell people it's a great book and just read it with com- self-compassion. Read it yes. with like patience and compassion. And it's an excellent book. Yeah. So great, great. We love your book too, by the way. Your book is some. Your book comes up very, very often, and the yeah. the part that comes up from your book that Jacqueline and I talk about all the time is the piece around the the gas and the brakes. And I yeah, know that, I connect the dots around that. Yeah, yeah you no, know, exactly. I was gonna pass it back to Jacqueline because that's something that she, you know, she talks he, about all the like, time. Psh, She's psh, done. The, psh, psh. Yeah. Mind blown in so many places. And I'm going to connect the dots back to actually what we were talking about in terms of media. One of the things that I realized after after reading the book and taking some of the quizzes, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about what I've realized in that moment too, was in social media right now, it's not just the magazine where we were seeing like, you know, the skinny woman with the big breasts. Now, every time I swipe, this is the kind of mom I'm supposed to be. This is what mm-hmm. my house is supposed to look like. This is what I'm supposed to dress like. Every swipe up is a new directive to me of what I am supposed to be like. And then yes. that all gets it's in my mind. It's just a list of all the ways you're failing. It's, oh, I love exactly. Instagram so much. It is a list of all the ways in which I am failing. And then, so what you talk about, you talk about the breaks in the gas or you talk about the things that inhibit or accept cite our sexual desire. And I recognized that the things that are my breaks or the things that are inhibiting are all of those things of noise are all of those like, ah, this morning I had that conversation with my daughter. I should have done that differently. Oh, like this little (laughs) bit of roll fat in my stomach. Like they're going to see that and know. And oh, like I should have done the laundry. All of those things are the things that just cloud being fully present. Really, those don't activate your sexual accelerator? <laughs> so what? I know. Right. Exactly. My perceived failure is so yeah. sexy. Can I just also add one more, one thing to that? I'm also yeah. experiencing, I'm actually not, I'm, I'm, I'm not on social media. I, I filter it very hard. I severe ADHD. If I, if I turn something like that on, hours are lost. So I don't go near it and, and I dip in and out. Even though that's what I choose for myself, I also get people tell me 
that I'm not getting back to them on social media, that I'm missing out on things when on social media. So even when I choose not to be on it, I still get fuck about it, you know? So there is it, it, both, both like this uh-huh. pull of social media and there's also a push mm-hmm. of society that said, no, what, what do you mean you're not on social media, right? So there's the push yeah. of society and there's a pull of the, the way the social media is designed. So yeah. even those of us who are like, no, I don't want to go anywhere near it. That's not working either. So all that stuff is around us. All that stuff is, ex- is affecting us and in full on breaks. Yeah. So yeah, tell, tell us about that. So uh, we're talking about the dual control model, which was mm-hmm. developed in the late 90s by Eric Johnson and John Bancroft, two sex researchers who were at the Kinsey Institute at the time. I am the child of the dual control model. Uh, and they made this wild leap of asking, what if the mechanism in our brain that controls sexual response works the same as all the other mechanisms in our brain, which has a pairing of excitatory and inhibitory systems, or uh, as I've taken to talking about it, the accelerator and the brakes. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's called the dual control model, because it's got two parts. And the accelerator notices all the sex-related information that's coming into the brain, everything from your exterosensitive senses, your what you see, hear, smell, touch, taste, and also everything that you think, believe, or imagine that your brain codes as, oh, that's sex related. And it sends the turn on signal. At the same time that that's happening, fortunately, your brakes are noticing all the good reasons not to be turned on right now. Everything that you see, hear, smell, touch, taste, and As you were saying, think, believe, or imagine, I should have had a different kind of conversation. I still haven't done the last of the laundry. Everything that your brain codes as a potential threat, and it sends a turn off signal. So the process of becoming aroused is a dual process of turning on the ons, yes, and that's the advice you usually get from from the women's magazines, or, and also turning off the offs. And it actually turns out that when people are struggling with any aspect of sexual arousal, desire, orgasm, pleasure, it's not because there's not enough stimulation to the accelerator. And sometimes it is, but a lot of the time it's because there's too much stuff hitting the brakes. And part of the reason there's so much stuff hitting the brakes is because we live in a very messed up world that is like constantly feeding us messages about all the ways that we are failing, explaining to us who we're supposed to be, and also that we will never be who we are supposed to be, that we don't deserve pleasure until we are that thing and we'll never be that thing, so we'll never deserve pleasure. And to get back to trauma also, if you have had sex used against you as a weapon, then when you begin to feel aroused, the arousal itself might activate the brakes because your brain has learned that sex itself is a potential threat, yeah. which interferes with the arousal process and shuts down the arousal process. And so the process of healing from that is really gradually experiencing degrees of pleasure inside your own skin, noticing that your brakes might be activated, your heart might start beating faster, you might feel a sort of like adrenaline, trembly, higher blood pressure experience. Stay at a low level of pleasure inside your skin and your brakes will gradually release as they recognize that you're safe. You're experiencing this level of arousal and you're safe. And after doing this multiple times in a week, the next week you go to a higher level of arousal and your brakes will come on and you stay at that level of arousal and your brakes will notice. You can talk to your brakes, be like, brakes, I appreciate the ways that you're keeping me safe Mm -hmm. and I want you to see that I am safe right now. Mm -hmm. Look, I can feel this and I'm safe. Mm -hmm. And then you gradually increase and increase and increase the level of arousal, the sexual explicitness of the arousal, like none of the things you've done so far involved any genital touching, right? And it's not until you get to like a pretty high level of I can feel safe when I'm experiencing arousal that you actually touch the genitals. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's called graded exposure if you want to look it up. Yeah. The concept of to me was also so important because with my partner and I, for example, there was a story at some point in my head that we had differing libidos. I had a higher libido. She had a lower libido, right? That was the story. And then we took the sexual temperament quiz. And I realized that it was actually that she has more breaks than I do. 
I realized I was like, oh, that's an issue for you. That's it. Like I, I realized like I was like, oh, all of these breaks that, that are stopping you from being fully present don't exist for me. But now knowing that they exist for you can allow me to help create an environment where then we can both be in that space that it wasn't about your body and your physical arousal. It was about the things in our environment and your mental yes! environment, your physical environment that were getting in the way. Yeah. That's exactly what the dual control model is for, to help people understand like it is not. So, for example, writing a book about sex is very, very unsexy. It is overwhelming and exhausting. And while I was writing Come As You Are, I was so overwhelmed and exhausted. I had even though I was reading, writing, talking, thinking about sex all day, every day, I had no interest in actually having any sex. Months of nothing. And nothing about my relationship had changed. Like, I'm still totally attracted to my partner. I want to have the energy to be sexually engaged, but my brakes are just locked down so hard right now. I got nothing, right? And if I didn't know about the dual control model, I might think there was something wrong with me, or maybe there was something wrong or changed about my partner, or maybe there was something wrong with our relationship. And really, it was just that the context was real screwed up. And when I could release my brakes, that's when the accelerator could do its job. You know, this makes me think of, I see the parallels in what you're saying. And was I was reading the book as well with polyvagal theory, right? Yeah. I'm so glad you saw that because yeah. yeah, it's in there. <laughs> right. So um, it feels like it has the same thing, right? Because polyvagal theory, you have to go up and down the steps. Like that's my favorite way of thinking about it. So if you're, you need to go, you know, if you're stuck on freeze, or if you're a fight or flight, you need to come down to, to stay and play. And until you go up and down, you're not going to be able to change. You're not going to skip. You can't skip one to the other, right? If you're not feeling safe and in this sort of social engagement part, doesn't matter how aroused you are if you're not in ventral vagal if you're stuck in sympathetic or or dorsal vagal you're not doesn't matter how aroused you are you're not going to get into that into that space right you're going to be stuck frozen or you're going to be afraid and and sort of fighting back yep so yeah it's like there's so many different ways of saying it's all talking about the same thing it's just we have different ways of 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 saying it and i think whichever way is resonating with people and then you know we're coming to solutions like like in jackie's situation you know this has been an ongoing conversation and she's suddenly like a light bulb Mm -hmm. moment going oh okay let's just instead of trying to fix it here let's fix it here and guess what now we're having sex every day all day yeah. And it was and it, it challenged the sexual scripts or the societal scripts, I should say, that we had, because the script that I had in my mind from from young is I'm too sexual all the time. Right. I like I think about mm-hmm. it too much. I want to do it too much. Like shame, 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 shame. Right. Grew up in a religious household. You know, are I you a high them, sensitivity uh, accelerator person? Tell me more about that. I don't know if I remember. So the when you do the quiz, did you score high on the accelerator? Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I scored high. Like, yes, high. Yeah, yeah. Yes, high yeah, accelerator. High sensitivity. Low yeah. breaks. Yes, just like, it's true. Just, like, br- just breathe on her. Essentially, we could just talk about <laughs> sex, and I'm like, all right, I'm ready. <laughs> um, but the, but there was so. But to your point earlier, around the arousal itself could be a trigger. That was got, come often what was happening for me. I mean, I had such a mm-hmm. A, a, mm-hmm. A, a tormented relationship with masturbation as a, as a teen because at any moment Jesus Christ was going to come down in the midst of my masturbation, and everyone would be. Taking taken up to heaven except me and and then everyone would know everyone would be up there looking for me and they would know they would know what happened they would know I would, why I was left behind and so there's there's been this narrative in my mind that I am too sexual and then my my mm-hmm. partner she identifies as masculine of center and I think that there's like this kind of societal script in her mind that she's supposed to always want sex she's supposed to and so when she didn't and I always did then we both had these narratives where she was feeling bad about herself because she wasn't living up I was feeling bad about myself because I want it too much. And we're both thinking it's about us or our bodies or our relationships. Mm. And then again, we took the quiz and we're like, oh, it's the laundry. You're <laughs> that's what it is. When yeah. the laundry's not done, that's on your mind. And so then that's why hotel sex and like vacation sex is so great. Because there's mm-hmm. no laundry, there's no dishes, right? You're like stepped away from all the things. And Change the like, context. Oh, yeah. we just need to address some of those things so that then you can be fully present. And that makes sense to me, which is why in the in the morning, for example, she's more turned on than I am because I think that she's like rested. She doesn't really yeah. get a sense of what's going on in the day. At the end of the day now, she knows all the things that she didn't yeah. do and whatever. And I'm like, let's go. So it was really helpful. It was really, really helpful. 
Oh, yeah. You know, uh, my podcast producer, Mo Laborde, is a queer woman who was born and raised in North Carolina, conservative Christian family. And she had the same insight that when she was aroused, because she has been taught from very early on that all things related to sexuality are bad. When she was aroused, the brakes would come on and that's going to slow down her experience of arousal. It's going to make it more frustrating and less pleasurable and she'll be more distracted. And she had read and loved Come As You Are already when we started working together. It was only when we started talking 101 that she was like, oh, so it's not just like sexual assault that can make sex a potential threat, according to your brain. It's also being shamed for sex mm-hmm. all your life makes sex a potential threat so that it hits the brakes. Oh, sure. I'm so, so, so glad that you told that story. That's so yeah. good. Totally. And if you think about how women are treated about their sexuality, the slut shaming that is associated with women who own their sexuality, and then there is we're wondering why women aren't aren't as sexual and there's all these research that's telling uh-huh. us, well, women aren't, we women don't want sex as much. You're like, is that true though? Is it that we had a great um, conversation with um, Grace Weltzer and she's doing research on the orgasm gap, right? And she's sort of, she was telling us all about the research and what she's saying is that one of the things that was told to us is, well, is it really women that women don't want sex or one, they get slut shamed so it's not safe to want it Two, the sex that's available to them is so poor quality, then why would they want something so poor quality where they don't get anything from it? So the orgasm gap is huge, especially straight women and straight men. So if you're not getting off, if you're then getting slut shamed and the experience is shitty because we don't talk about sex, isn't it normal that you don't want that thing? Like, There's a sex researcher named Peggy Kleinplatz whose work I highly recommend. She wrote a book with Dana Maynard titled Magnificent Sex. Mm -hmm. And the way Peggy puts it is sometimes low desire is evidence of good judgment. Ah, love that. Yes. (laughs) That's how I feel. (laughs) (laughs) That is actually. And you know who doesn't have an orgasm gap? Queer couples. Yes. Yeah, it's so interesting because it's true. We were we, when we were talking to Grace about that that it is straight men, mm-hmm. cisgender straight men have mm-hmm. the most orgasms, followed by gay men, bi men, and lesbians. Lesbian women, and yeah. then then you go down, <laughs> and it's straight cisgendered women, right. bi women, mm-hmm. bi women, and straight gender. Yes, that's right. Straight. Yes, so it's that's a, right. Bi women bi is a little women bit love. above. And yeah. then, yes, yeah, yes. And, and the conclu- you can't you can't avoid coming to the conclusion that once men get involved in women's pleasure, that's where the orgasm gap appears. And it goes yeah. back to what you were saying about the winning and about the horniness and about the anger. Like these are the things that I get to claim. It is about me and my experience because that's how I've been socialized. Right. As the woman, I've been socialized not to speak up and to be yeah. to be of service to you. I can't tell yep. you the amount of times that I was more focused on arching my back and making the noise exactly. than I was about my actual pleasure in a situation. And yeah. so they think I'm enjoying it. And poor, poor guy I was with was like, she's having a great time because I knew how to look like I was having a great time. Exactly. But I wasn't. And so we're all just, again, we go back to where we started. We're all just playing this game. But you had to put on the show. Like, yes, yes. To protect yes. your partner's entire sense of identity. Yes. You had to put on the show. Yes. There's a really amazing thing that's been happening in the sex research over the last five or so years, which is that they've begun to measure the actual literal patriarchy. Wow. So mm-hmm. measuring the orgasm gap and recognizing that really it's straight women who are suffering, like that's the patriarchy. There was a Vice article about a really good paper that was like, so the reason women in cis het relationships don't want sex is because of man children. <laughs> yes. Like you wouldn't want to have sex with a man child, with somebody mm-hmm. who you have to clean up after all day, every oh. day. Sure. Women's low desire in these situations is not caused by anything about their brain chemistry. Like there's nothing wrong with you if you don't want to have sex with someone who has never cleaned their own underwear during your relationship. Sure. Exactly. And once you're in that maternal role, Ugh. we know that's not where the erotic lives because we're not supposed to fancy or fuck our parents. So if you got these 
parental dynamic installed into your relationship because you're not taking you're not taking responsibility for your actions and wondering why your partner doesn't want to fuck you well you don't want to fuck your children or your parents it's just not where the erotic lives so and then we're wondering why there's no sex in relationships yeah and the reason is of the patriarchy yes <laughs> And it's neither person's fault. Like nobody chose to have these scripts handed to them and just embedded in their brains. Nobody picked that. But it absolutely is the case that couples who sustain a strong sexual connection over the long term do this labor of like digging out all the junk that got planted in their brains about who they're supposed to be, all the messages about safety and bodies and love and worthiness and sex and pleasure and the erotic And they discard everything that is not relevant to who they are and what's happening in their relationship. Mm -hmm. And this is true no matter what the gender combination is. Queer couples have an advantage because they've already had to do a bunch of that work just in the process of understanding that they don't fit the cishet norm. But that doesn't mean they're done. I interviewed lesbian woman for the book I'm writing right now who talked about coming out in her late 20s getting into the lesbian bar scene and feeling more like she was stuck into a femme role than she ever felt when she was in the heterosexual world. Mm. And people were like taken aback when she was like, okay, I may be the femme person, but like my pleasure really matters. And I want to touch my partner and I'm not interested in being with a partner who's not interested in being touched. Like, Mm -hmm. cool, if you don't want to be touched, but that's not for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like those rigid the rigid rules carry themselves into the communities that exist because those rules are wrong Mm -hmm. yes so it's everybody the more work we do to clear out that gender stuff and uh, peggy klein plots research is on people who experience extraordinary sex optimal sexual experiences and when you how do you get to be a person who has optimal sexual experiences their main answer is i decided that everything I had ever been taught about sex was a lie. And I started from scratch, honoring what was actually true about what's inside me and what's happening with my partner or partners. Yeah. Beautiful. Can you tell us a little bit about your book that you're working on? Now I got curious. Yeah, it's uh, it's about sex in long-term relationships. Oh, mm-hmm. yeah. love that topic. Yes. And the, yes. the short version is there's three characteristics of the couples who sustain a strong sexual connection. One is that they prioritize sex. They decide that it matters for them yes. that they have sex. And look, it is normal and natural for there to be times in a long relationship, especially where sex is not a priority. Mm-hmm. And the couples who sustain a strong sexual connection find their way back to each other because for some reason, it contributes something really important that they stop doing all the other things they could be doing. Maybe they got kids to raise. Maybe they got jobs to go to or school to go to, other friends and family to pay attention to. Sometimes, God forbid, you just want to like watch a movie and go to sleep, right? We are busy. Why would we stop doing all those other things and just like roll around and rub our skins together and lick each other's genitals. Why? And it's because it matters for some reason. They prioritize sex. They decide that it matters. Two, uh, they have a strong friendship with a foundation of admiration and kindness Mm -hmm. and trust, which we talked Mm -hmm. about. And third, they dismantle the gender shit in their brains and Mm -hmm. in their relationship, no matter what the gender combination of the people is yeah that stuff is so insidious i i was with men only for the first 30 something years of my life and then almost exclusively women for the last decade and when i got married to my wife i realized like years in that i kept yep. serving her the bigger portions of food and i would like make sure she you know got her food first before my daughter and i and at some point i was like what am I doing? And I was just replaying what my mom had done with my dad and what I had done with my husband and doing it with her. And we were two women. Like, so that stuff to your point that the patriarchy, I have a mug that I drink from every morning that says I have 99 problems and the patriarchy is basically all of them. Like, yes, it, it, it has nothing to do with my queerness. It is so embedded and rooted in my script that there's yeah. constant decoding that I have to do. There's constant like reflection that has to happen and just breaking it apart and then, and having a discipline of, of, of trying not to let it creep into my mind, into my relationship, into my parenting, all of those things. And it's so gorgeous that you're noticing it and making active choices, that you're not just following along with what's in your head without recognizing, like, am I actually choosing this behavior? 
Yeah. 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 So I want to ask about that because you on your website have a lot of different tools. We mentioned the the sexual temperament quiz, which I highly Mm -hmm. recommend. There's the sexual cues assessment, the turning Mm -hmm. on and offs. You talk about stress. There's there's different resources there. I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit and maybe we can end our conversation around what happens next. So someone's listening to this. Can we talk a little bit about self-reflection and dialogue with partners and the importance Mm -hmm. of that in terms of switching and, and, and trying to move towards amazing, excellent, great sex. Yeah. And there's also the Come As You Are workbook, which is if you're like, I don't yes. need to have the science explained to me. I don't have to like hear examples of other people experiencing things. Just yes. tell me what to do. Come As You Are workbook. Love me a workbook. Love it. <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, Love me too. Me a workbook. Yes. I actually made the workbook because therapists kept asking me, like, I need a tool to use with my clients. Mm-hmm. Like, people are not going to read your 100,000 word book of affective neuroscience and metaphors. Mm-hmm. Just tell them what to do. So I wrote uh, I did. The I loved it. Every, every word of it. <laughs> every word yeah, of it. I, I loved it. Book. I went for the workbook. I was exactly. like, oh, yeah, I need the math. I, yeah. lo- I looked at the citations. I followed up with all the research. Yes, I did. Oh, I love that. That's, that's what they're there for. <laughs> I get so frustrated when people like criticize something about the book and I'm like, that was in the footnotes and notes. So I I love that you're like, let me go actually read that science because the science is amazing. Okay. So, uh, and also if people are listening to this and they're like, sex is very much not available to me because gestures wildly at the state of the world. There's also Burnout, which is the book. There's a, a reason why my first book was about sex and the second book was about stress. So if you're like, sex is not going to happen for me, go to burnout. And in January, the burnout workbook is coming out. Uh, Oh, yay. Yeah. My sister was in charge. I co-wrote burnout with my sister and she was in charge of the workbook. And she is a pretty self-critical and pessimistic person. And even she was like, the workbook's really good. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. I'm working on, on similarly working on a workbook around change and kind of the, the, the shift that we have to make when we realize, when we have that realization that that memo that we got is bullshit and we want to do something differently. But now I have a family and I have a job and I have a husband and I have kids, but I realize that actually it may be by and I don't want to do the same. Like, how do you dismantle and rebuild? And I'm mm-hmm. working on with my sister who's an illustrator. That's amazing. Um, I know. That's sister love. I love it. I love it. Okay. So reflection and dialogue. Yes. So recognize that it's not just about recognizing what's true. You're going to have to go through a process of grieving for the opportunity cost of all the things you could have had and known and the ways your life would have been gentler and more pleasurable if you had known this stuff before. And you're going to go, part of that grief is rage about the fact that you were lied to for so long and you believed it and you invested time and energy and your identity in trying to conform with these things. And what did it get you? It got you lied to and pretending and not aware of your own internal experience. So there's rage and grief that has to be acknowledged and worked through. In addition to the like self-exploration and understanding what's true about you, the thing I say over and over that I teach people to live with confidence and joy in their bodies, what do I mean by confidence and joy? Confidence is knowing what's true. And that's the reflection part, the like what's actually true about my brakes and accelerator, what's true about the way I experience arousal, desire, pleasure, orgasm, what's true about my sexual identity and my gender identity and my relationship and the world I live in, knowing what's true. Joy is the hard part. Because it's loving what's true about your body and your relationship and your sexual identity and your gender identity and the world that you live in. Loving what's true, even if it's not what everyone has been telling you should be true. Loving what's true, even if it's not what you wish were true. Joy is the hard part. Sure. So the reflection process, when you bring that into a relationship, I'm mostly going to talk about the heterosexual experience here because there's a special barrier, especially in the deconstruction of the binary from that relationship. There is a catch-22 that women have always been put in the role of taking care of men. And we want the man in the relationship to start like dealing with more of his own shit and like opening up and being a whole the whole person that he has always been, but hasn't felt like he's allowed to be to like deconstruct his own shit instead of like just leaning on the partner. And the irony is so like 
it makes sense that at the beginning of the process of deconstructing the binary in your relationship, you're like, you got to fix your shit. I'm not responsible for managing your emotions. I have been doing that work for years and you got to, you got to deal with your own shit. But the thing is, it's really hard. Like it's going to be really hard and really scary for him. And you're going to have to help your dude. The key to helping your dude without falling into the trap of just recapitulating the same, like, I will care for your feelings. I will hold you and make sure you are safe. And I will pro- I will take on your feelings for you so that you don't have to feel them. The key to making sure you don't fall back into the trap is to be present with his difficult feelings about the, the shame and the grief and the rage that he has about the fact that he's been trying to live according to these rules and it didn't get him any of the things that he wanted. Be there with it. Turn toward his difficult feelings with kindness and compassion. He's given you cupcakes when he does that. Just, just return the cupcakes, reciprocal cupcakes. I can be there with kindness and compassion without feeling all those feelings for him. Is it fair that a woman would have to do even more emotional labor in order to de-binary her relationship? It's not about fair. It's just going to be necessary. Mm -hmm. How do you see that show up differently in queer relationships? Because you spoke to, and it makes sense. There's, I I completely understand that there's an extra complication in, in heterosexual relationships. What does that look like in queer relationships? It looks like the same thing with a little bit of a head start. Because you can notice, why am I treating my partner the way my mother treated her husband? When, like, I have visual evidence that my partner is not the same, it's right in front of me. And also, I have done all this other work to, like, recognize the ways in which I am not like my mother. I don't want to be like that. But here I am doing this thing at the beginning and you can talk to your partner and you probably have at least some shared language already about talking about, I mean, like I, in my relationship, I can use like the gender binary and the patriarchy and misogyny and my partner does not get activated, but there's a lot of people for whom those words are totally unwelcome in their relationship. And how do you have a conversation about internalized homophobia if you can't talk about misogyny? So the shared language that already exists is going to be helpful. It is not, it's not easy for anybody. The stuff is so pervasive and so deeply rooted in our brains. You will never be done. This is one of the yeah. problems with writing the book is like people want an answer so that they can get to their happily ever after and be done forever. And it's like, ah, your happily ever after is that you will get better and better and better. And it will only get better and better and yeah. better, except for the times when it's harder and worse. But then it gets better and better and you're never done. No, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. And and I think you're right. The awareness makes it the first thing after awareness is that it's really hard. So if you get yes. to the awareness place and you're like, wait, it doesn't feel better. Let's just tell nope. you now it actually is going to feel worse first. Yeah. And then eventually can get better. It's like when you stop right, the whipping yourself. Exactly. Yes. You're going to actually feel that pain and it's going to take some time for you to heal it. Absolutely right. Yeah. Absolutely and right. if you can go to your partner and be like, so I stopped beating myself up. I stopped whipping myself. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I am in so much pain as a result of that. If they can be like, I get it. I understand yeah. that, that I want to be here for you. I want to help to care for the wounds that you've been inflicting on yourself, that the world has been inflicting on you. It's one of the most connection building, loving, deep human things that we can do for each other. Yeah. Is to be present with kindness and compassion for all of those difficult feelings that come with trying to create a relationship that is different from the one the world has been trying to force you to have. I don't know if that sentence made sense. No, it did. It lands. For more on Emily Nagowski, you can visit her website, emilynagowski.com, or find her on Instagram at E. Nagowski and on TikTok at Emily Nagowski or on the Come As You Are podcast. You can also find her books, Come As You Are and Burnout on our reading list. If you visit wearecuriousfoxes.com backslash reading list. Once on our website, you'll find blog posts, episodes, and videos sorted under your favorite categories like pleasure, kink, communication, jealousy, family, dating, and more. If you want to share your thoughts on this episode and connect with other Foxy listeners, then head to Facebook and join our Facebook group at We Are Curious Foxes. 
To support the show and find a slew of podcast extras, including mini episodes, after hour conversations, and over 50 videos from educator led workshops, then go to Patreon at We Are Curious Foxes. If you've enjoyed this episode, we would love for you to subscribe to our show on Apple Podcasts or follow us on Spotify and Stitcher. This tells the podcast gods that content like this matters. And for extra bonus points, rate the show and leave a comment so that others know the kind of impact that this show has had on you and your relationships. And finally, let us know that you're listening by sharing a comment, a story, or a question. You can email us or send us a voice memo to listening at wearecuriousfoxes.com. This episode is produced by Effie Blue and Jacqueline Mesla, with help from Yamur Arkishin. Our editor is Nina Pollock who allows us to come exactly as we are each and every week. Our intro music is composed by Dev Saha. We are so grateful for their work, and we're grateful to you for listening. As always, stay curious, friends. Curious Fox podcast is not and will never be the final word on any topic. We solely aim to encourage curiosity and provide a space for exploration through connection and story. We encourage you to listen with an open and curious mind, And we'll look forward to your feedback. Stay curious, friends. Stay curious. Stay curious. Stay curious. Stay curious. Stay curious. Stay curious. curious. Stay curious.